nine-step process. It starts with establishing this norm of joy and confidence of feeling loved. You do need to have confidence and I do want you to to stop and think for a moment that confidence is not something that is given to you. You know, there's this whole pattern of thinking that's been popular for centuries in which a person looks at another person and says, boy, look at the confidence that he has. I wish I had been given that. The nerve of a person to say that. That person who has that confidence wasn't given that. A person who has that confidence did that. And that is important to know. If I can get you to hear that, there is a sense of urgency about this, isn't there? Does it come across? I don't know if you know how much I feel this and how important it is, I think. And it may not be, but I think it is so vitally important for a few people to find out a person who has confidence is not a person who was given confidence. It is a person who did it, who became confident, who committed themselves to being a confident person. Now, how do I know that? It would be easier if I had some movies of me before I had confidence. I know what it's like to be afraid of the sound of your own voice in a room full of people and to think, I don't want to speak because somebody will hear me. And, uh, and they probably don't think my ideas are worth listening to anyway. And if I'm going to talk with anybody at all, it'll be with the shyest person in the group. I'll seek them out and I'll go over in the corner and we'll stand in the corner and talk while all those people are enjoying themselves out there. I've been through all that business of being painfully shy, frightened, all of those things, not feeling good about myself. When I was in my teens, I thought I was the ugliest kid alive. You know, it's not until I was 35 years old and looked back at a picture of me when I was a teenager, I thought, my God, was I that good looking? I, you know, I, ne I certainly never knew it then, you know, but I wasn't all that bad. I mean, by comparison, at least, you know. I had this image of myself as being ugly and weak and untalented and all sorts of things that weren't working for me and I found a different thing when I decided to be confident because confidence works better. And it's not something that you have, it is not something that you get, it is something that you do. You decide, I express this with confidence. It's a decision. Now, so many of these things are decisions that it's unbelievable at first until you begin to make the decisions. You decide to be joyous. You are not given joy. It just doesn't come to you like a basket out of heaven. You see these joyous people and you think, I wish I had that kind of joy. Well, do it. It's not having it. It's doing it. These are actions. They are thoughts. They are actions which follow thoughts. And what I have to decide to do is think joyous thoughts and produce joyous actions, and then I have joy. Not because it was given to me, but because I did it. I did joy. I did love. I decided confidence. I spoke with confidence because I decided to speak in a confident way. I decided to stand in a confident way. You know something that always interests me? It came up just a couple of days ago. Uh, by the way, I got my luggage back. Isn't that nice? Um, but before I got my luggage back, I needed a suit. 
And the thing happened that always happens. Everyone always assumes that I am several sizes larger than I am. <laughs> you know, I think that's quite all right. Do you know how hard I work to project the image that I'm several sizes larger than I am? You know, that has a lot more to do with confidence, with projection, with the way you communicate, than with the physical dimensions. You'd be surprised the different impression that a person gets about your size, about your height, about your bulk as you communicate with that kind of confidence, when you, when you come at them like a steamroller. You know? Now, what I'm saying is that, that the decision to communicate confidence, the decision to be confident, to speak confidently, to accept yourself, all of those things will look to everybody else like a gift that you were given by God and only you will know. This is mine because I am a creator. Yeah, God gave it to me. I am God. It's my identity. It's who I am. It's what I am. You know, that... Uh, that always seems a bit like blasphemy to most people to say, that's who I am, I am God. I was on a television show one time and I was saying some of my usual stuff and this lady who was interviewing me looked at me and said, just who are you anyway? <laughs> and I said, uh, I'm God. <laughs> she said, now I know you're crazy. Um, but you know, I can say that on good authority. It always helps, especially in a religious crowd, to mention that Jesus said it first. That's my authority. You know, I can get away with anything that he already said. What he said to this great crowd of people, and I want you to note that he was not talking to the twelve apostles. He was not talking to saints. He was talking to a mass of people and absolutely incredulous in his voice and in his manner. He looked at those people and he said, What? Don't you know who you are? I have said, Ye are gods, children of the Most High. That's who you are. Don't you know it? And he said, All of the things that I can do, you can do. Greater things than this you can do. When I begin to realize I am an expression of God. That's who I am. It's what I am. It's my nature. And when I create, what I create is created. When I create confidence, confidence manifests. But if I'm busy creating shyness, then I have the gift of shyness. Isn't that wonderful? When I'm creating fear, when I am imaging fear, here's something fascinating I bet you didn't know about emotion. Did you know that there's no such thing as fear? You don't look convinced. <laughs> but it's true. There is no such thing as fear. Because fear is a fantasy of something that hasn't happened. It has no reality. It's fantasizing something dangerous that could happen. I'm thinking about a possibility. It doesn't even exist. It's only a fantasy in my mind. You know what fear is? Fear is faith in evil. Having confidence in evil is fear. If I take that and start fantasizing what could happen in this situation, then my fantasy produces an emotional reaction, a chemical reaction, and I experience fear in the body. But all of that is a result of a fantasy if something hasn't even existed. What I create is 
What I create exists, it happens within me. I create an image of a fearful person and I've got one. I create an image of an ill person, I've got one. I create an image of disease and it exists. I create an image of confidence and it exists. And I know from experience that when I am sick, when I have created an ill person and he exists, then something challenges me and I have to create an image of a well person and a whole person. I do that by gum. The interesting thing is the disease sits up and takes notice. Now at first it resists. I'm not going anywhere, it says. And I says to it, well, don't, but I'm going to feel good and I'm going to get on about my business. And it goes, I mean, disease just can't stand that. It just doesn't like living in a well body. It's death to disease to feel good. To create a well, joyous, happy, productive, healthy individual causes things to happen. You're a creator. And as you increasingly, more and more, begin to know that and create a different kind of being, one who thinks in a different way, one who has the things that you wish you had. I wish I had confidence. I wish I had ability to communicate. I wish I had a joyous disposition. I wish I had a beautiful face. Do you know, a few years ago, when I was first teaching inner light consciousness, there was a beautiful lady in Atlanta, Georgia, who was the proprietress of a school for models. She had all these hopeful young ladies coming to her, and it was her job to turn them into beautiful creatures with lots of confidence to go out and, and get jobs modeling clothes and doing advertisements and so on. It was a very popular thing at that time for all young ladies to go to modeling school just in order to learn to do their makeup and their hair and their clothes and be beautiful and all this. And this lady heard me teaching ILC and she said, look, that's exactly what my girls need. Would you come and teach it in our school? So I said, yes, but something I would like to do is just sit and observe what you do. I want to know what you teach these girls that makes these gorgeous creatures come walking out your doors. And so I was teaching inner light consciousness in the evening uh, to her school of all these wonderful girls. And I was seeing the new girls coming in. And you know, one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen is the difference between the new girls coming in and the girls finishing the course. It looked like they were two different species. There was such a dramatic difference in the way girls started and in the way they finished. There was dramatic difference in the way they walked, the position of their shoulders, the position of their head, and most of all, in what came out of their face. And so I thought, I want to watch this miracle of transformation. And I watched this lady, the first day, she only had these girls walking back and forth in front of a mirror and saying aloud, every time they passed them their image, they would look at their image and say, you are beautiful. And they would tell themselves that over and over and over. And she didn't even have to tell them, straighten up your shoulders. You could watch the shoulders going up and back as they began to say that repeatedly over and over. You began to watch their belief about themselves change. And when a girl, when a girl who's very plain thinks she's beautiful and comes walking up to you with the confidence of beauty, it's pretty hard to think otherwise of her in spite of her features. And I began to watch that sort of thing begin to happen. I was watching a woman create beautiful girls out of girls who did not believe that they were beautiful. And the interesting thing is that there was a lot that seemed to change about their figure and their face too. You can take a rather plain girl who's radiating joy and it does something to people. She looks happy, she looks joyous, there's something beautiful about her. A difference in what you're communicating. 
Now, the thing is, over a period of time, it'll literally affect your features. It will literally affect your body, make you even more physically beauty, beautiful, as well as allowing you to communicate beauty. I'm just saying, you can create the being that you would like to be if you'll stop wishing you were and start being. And that can start from now with decision. Start looking at the things that you wish you were and decide to be that instead. Decide to be a confident being and start walking like one, start talking like one, and start saying things with confidence. And you'll find very quickly, I'm not talking about pretending you're confident. I'm talking about start doing things in a confident way and very soon you'll find you are confident and you don't have to pretend. The confidence is yours because you took it. You created it. You decided it. You made it and you are a creative being. And what you create is. It results in you. Start then from a normal baseline of being joyous and then the nine step process begins when I notice that there is something that has happened and I am feeling less than joyous. Any moment that I am feeling anything, absolutely anything other than feeling joy and confident, glad that I'm alive, when I've departed from that, I've departed from the norm, and so I recognize, this is the first step, recognize that departure. Recognize the fact that I am experiencing something less than joy, or I am experiencing something that could be described as an emotion. And the second thing that you do is give what you feel a description. Describe what you feel, and I don't mean use a term like I'm angry, or I'm depressed, or I'm jealous, or any of the standard labels, and I'll tell you why. All of those standard labels are socially acceptable. And if what you're feeling is described by you, quite literally, you'll find that it is, in fact, something that people disapprove of. Let me give you an example. It is socially acceptable to say, I'm angry. In fact, you can even say, you made me angry. It's not true, of course, but you could say it. And that other person who has done something to which you have responded with anger has done something that you didn't want them to do. What you're really feeling is a need to get them to do something other than they want to do. Now that's manipulation. Why are you calling it anger? When you begin to realize that you are having emotion for a reason and you are using that emotion to try to do something, then it becomes a whole different thing. Your anger is really an attempt to get somebody else to act the way you want them to act and not the way they want to act. And so instead of calling it anger, call it what it is. I am trying to affect another person with this energy that I'm putting out that I'm calling emotion and I'm trying to get them to do something other than what they want to do. Manipulation of another person. Um, that's only one example. Jealousy could be used. I am jealous of another person. My boyfriend is paying attention to that other girl and I'm feeling jealous. What are you really feeling? Don't use that label, jealous. What are you really feeling? Well, I'm feeling that she is beautiful and that she is getting his attention and that I am less beautiful than she is, which means if he has good sense, he'll go with her and I'm afraid that's going to happen. Well, when you look at jealousy for what it really is, it changes the whole picture, doesn't it? 
I mean, that's what jealousy is, lack of confidence in my own beauty and in my own ability to, to project what I have and what I am. If I can describe it, if I can describe the emotion that I'm feeling, instead of just labeling it, I'll see it in a different way. That's the second step. The third step in the process is to take responsibility, which means instead of saying, you made me angry or you hurt my feelings, if I will say in this third step, I have decided. Um, accepting responsibility says, I have decided to respond in this way to the situation. Instead of saying, I am angry, I have decided to respond with anger. I have chosen this way of acting because it is something that I'm doing. By all means, change your language around to take responsibility for what you're doing because emotions are not something that happen to you. Emotions are something that you do. And when you realize that, you'll take responsibility for what you do in a whole different way. You're responsible for the way you feel. You are not just experiencing depression. You are doing depression. It is something that you do. It is a decision based on getting a particular result. So I am not just depressed. I am expressing depression. And if I realize that I am actively doing that and that, uh, that that is not the way that I normally feel, that's important. It's a departure from the way I normally feel. And I describe it in detail. What am I really feeling? Don't just label it depression. What am I really feeling? And I take responsibility for it. That is something that I'm doing. It's an activity. I am doing it. I am thinking it. I am believing it. I am acting upon it, which reinforces it, by the way. Then it's, it's my responsibility, and I can take a different action. There are other choices. And having taken the responsibility for it, what's the next step? Okay. Better get some, some of these people on the ball. There are all these potential instructors around here. Okay. Identify what it was that happened, the excuse for my having this emotion. What was the incident? that was the catalyst um, that started my feeling. What is it that I would blame this on? What is the incident or what is the word or what is the thought? Identify that as specifically as you can. It was this specific word in what he said or it was the way that he said it. It was this expression. That is the part that, that triggered my emotional reaction. And step five is called identify the cause. I better put catalyst here. Now you might want to write down all of these steps um, because we're going to be using them a couple of times. We're going to use it with the journal as well. So I'm going to go over this with you first and then I'll go over how to use it with your journal in process. Identify the catalyst, the incident that allowed me to be emotion emotional and then identify the cause. Now the interesting thing is that the cause of your emotion is never the incident that happened and you can underline that word never. It is never, never, never the incident that made you emotional. It is always, always, always a belief that you have about that incident that made you emotional. The real cause the real cause of your feelings, the real cause of every emotion that you will ever experience is a belief that you hold. A belief that you hold about the catalyst, about the thing that happened. So the cause of your emotion is always a belief. Always. Now, so you want to decide what that belief is. Um, an example. Um, 
One example that I think of is that if a person, an insecure person of course, because no one else could do this, if a person thinks that you think too much of yourself or something like that, he wants to express how displeased he is with you, then he might insult your mother. Right? Now, here's a guy who, out of anger, says some unkind, insulting thing about your mother. This guy never met your mother. Doesn't know anything about her at all, but he has insulted your mother. Now that means that you are obligated to be angry, right? Defend your honor. I mean, someone insulted my mother. I mean, I'm supposed to be angry. I mean, I have a little pride, you know. So I have a responsibility to defend my mother's honor by being angry. Now isn't there something a little strange about that? I defend my mother's honor by being angry? Isn't that really honorable to your mother? No, you don't see that. Okay. Now, the idea was what he said was the catalyst. He insulted my mother. But that's not what made me angry. What made me angry was my belief that when somebody says something about my mother and I don't respond to it, that means that I am weak. The interesting thing is, I wasn't defending my mother's honor at all, was I? I was defending his belief about me. He wouldn't have said that if he hadn't thought I was chicken. I'm doing it for me, and yet I claim to be protecting my mother's honor when I know that this person doesn't know my mother and there's nothing that he said about her that can affect her honor one way or the other, make her good or bad or indifferent, whatever. This is the sort of thing that we deal with, even in, uh, in marriages. I mean, when you're doing marriage counseling, it gets really interesting to see one partner say something that they don't even believe because they know that that's what upsets the other one the most. They pick up this thing, I know that she doesn't like this, so I'm gonna throw this one at her, and of course, she told him which one it was that she didn't like so that he could throw it at her, you know. I mean, we do that in marriages, don't we? One of the first things that we do is establish what it is that hurts me the most just so that you can use that when you're angry with me. We tell each other where, our, where the chip on our shoulder is so that we have all the ammunition that we want for our mutual war that's going to last so many years. Well, this is the kind of thing that we're doing with this, this business of saying, I'm not responsible for how I feel, you're responsible for how I feel. Which means I can say, I'm sad because you don't love me anymore. Well, if you don't love me anymore, then there's all the more reason for me to take responsibility for being loved. That's not a reason for me to be unhappy or joyous. In fact, if you don't love me anymore, you don't care whether I'm joyous or not, do you? So it becomes my responsibility, and why should I be sad in order to try to get you to love me? Do you, have you ever seen a person who is being jealous? Jealousy is ugly. Do you know that jealousy is designed to get somebody to like me better than him? I'm going to do that by being ugly? Do you see how absolutely ridiculous these things are? I mean, negative emotions usually operate in reverse. I want my wife to pay some attention to me, so what do I do? I fall silent. And she looks, and she wonders what's wrong, and she thinks, uh-oh, he's being silent. I better just leave him alone. How often do our negative emotional expressions get exactly the opposite result of what it is we're looking for? Find what it is that I believe about what the person said or did, this catalyst, 
that makes me have an emotional reaction to it. What do I believe about that? Do I believe that it hurts me, that it devalues me, that in some way it works against me? Describe the belief. Then the next step is examine the validity of that belief. Is it true? Is it true, for example, that a person uh, insulting my mother does anything to her honor? Or is it true that his saying something insulting to my mother points out my weakness? Is it true that if I don't respond with anger that I am weak? Is that belief valid? Uh, whatever the belief that was the, the source of the emotion, examine the validity of it, find out if it's correct or not. Having done that, step seven, examine and find out what is your carrot. And what that means is, what was the goal that you sought to establish by being emotional? What is the carrot that you wanted to get out of it? What's the reward? If I got angry because you said something, then my carrot is to get you to take back what you said. That's why I got angry, in order to get you to correct the situation. That was my carrot. If I got jealous, what I was looking for in expressing my jealousy was to get you to pay attention to me instead of somebody else. I wanted you to know that I disapprove, and I want you to turn your attention back to me. That's my carrot. Okay, so you understand the way that I'm using that word. That's the goal of the emotion. We call it a carrot because that's what you use to lead a donkey around by his nose. Um, then step eight, I'm running out of room. This isn't a very big blackboard. Um, step eight is to establish the cause effect relationship between the emotion and the carrot that you wanted to get. In other words, will my being angry get you to take back what you said, or will it make you escalate what you said? Establish the cause-effect relationship between your emotion and the result that you wanted to get from your emotion. And nine times out of ten, with a negative emotion, you'll find out that it got precisely the opposite effect of what you really wanted when you got emotional. Establish the cause-effect relationship, step eight. And step number nine is, if that emotion didn't get the result that you wanted, what would? That's nine steps, and that ninth step gives you a new response which you can have in situations like that in the future. Now, I want to make a point that the nine-step process is designed to, to use either during an emotional situation or after it, which is to say before it. And the reason that is to say before it is because of this. Remember the philosophy that says, you and I each have a teacher. You have a teacher that knows what you most need to learn. And your teacher, your inner teacher, your higher teacher, is absolutely committed to seeing that you learn it. Which means, if there are situations, weaknesses that you have that produce negative emotions in you, your teacher is committed to making sure that you meet those situations. Now that means, if I'm having a negative emotional reaction to something today, and I handle that badly, it means I'm going to get another chance. Okay? Now, if I know that I'm going to get another chance, that is the reason for the nine-step process. I know it's going to happen again. I know that by the fact that I handled it so badly today. Now, what do I do? I sit down tonight, when it's journal time, I sit down with my journal and I go over that situation in my head and I say, okay, I was feeling joyous, I met so-and-so, 
and she said so and so and I got really emotional okay so I recognized the departure from joy I was feeling emotional and I described the emotion that I was feeling not just I was angry but I was feeling that she said what she did and I didn't want her to say that I wanted her to say something else and and uh, and I really wanted to put enough energy into my expression of displeasure so that she noticed it or maybe I didn't show it to her I waited until I got away from her and under my breath I was saying all of these things I wanted to impress myself with that emotion to the point that I find some way to do something about it. So in any way, I describe what I was feeling. I describe that out in a bit of detail. Now, I'll take responsibility. She said what she said. And I could have responded to that with any number of emotions. I could have responded to that with confidence. Uh, with uh, with whatever but anyway I chose to feel anger this is a choice it's what I'm doing I'm responsible for how I feel I don't even want to give her the authority to decide what I feel that's my responsibility so I accept it that's that step and the next step what was it well it was this particular word and the way she said it that was the catalyst Okay, my belief, my belief is that a person who says something like that to me doesn't have much respect for me. The interesting thing is that belief may be valid. Maybe that does mean that she doesn't have much respect for you. But does that mean that you are worth less because she doesn't respect you? Does that change your respectability in fact? And in fact, does my emotional reaction confirm what she suspected about my respectability? Okay, is the belief valid? What do I really want now from my emotion? I want to get even with her. I want to think up something to say in return. I want to get her to recognize that I am respectable. I want to restore that feeling. What is my carrot? And if, there, if I still want that carrot, what is a better way to go about it than to feel this anger? You know, what, what we usually get out of an emotional reaction is hurt in ourselves. I mean, I want to rectify a situation and so what I do is poison my own system with anger or with jealousy or with fear or with hurt or with depression or whatever. And what it usually earns for me is a little less happiness in my own life and very seldom gets from that other person what I wanted to get from them. This is a process that I can go through and I can say, okay, if I handle that badly today, then there's going to be a similar situation coming up soon. How do I want to respond to it? That's a way that I can use this technique. And listen, this is not a technique for suppressing emotion. It is a technique for forming a different belief about the incident that caused the emotional reaction and choosing a different response. You won't feel that emotion, so you won't have to suppress it if you realize what that person is expressing is their own insecurity. I am not the target. It's not mine, and there's no reason that I should take it into me and make their insecurity my problem. Okay, that's the process, and I'll tell you what we'll do. It's getting late tonight, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on operating it. But what I would like you to do tonight, or during the day tomorrow, or both, is make a list of some negative emotions that you have felt recently. Don't just sit down and start listing negative emotions. But I'd like you to go back through your day today and see if there's anything that occurred today that made you feel uncomfortable. 
emotion, emotional in some way. Um, frustrated, angry, afraid, disapproved of, whatever you felt. Um, describe that situation and see if you can use this nine step process to go through it and take it apart. And one of the best ways to do this is to do it with somebody else. In fact, that's what we'll be doing in class for a part of the day, probably on Saturday. You'll be working with somebody else in class to help you go through an emotional situation and take it apart. But it'll work better if you've already examined some of these yourself and see if you can find better ways to respond to situations that have in the past caused a, a negative emotional response in you, is to look at incidents that are happening to you during your day and notice that they're happening for a reason. Um, one of the best ways to, to uh, discover that an incident is a lesson is to notice that you're having an emotional reaction to it. You usually do respond with frustration or fear or some kind of emotion to the lessons of life. And that's how you identify it. So if you have an incident that causes an emotional reaction, by the way, some lessons are pleasant and beautiful and good, and it's all right to identify those too. Something that caused you to respond with pride, with extra joy, with feeling very loved, something that, that felt almost like a reward from heaven. I mean, somebody really uh, complimented you, whatever. Put those down too, because your teacher is trying to tell you something, and sometimes what your teacher is saying to you is, you did that just right. And that's beautiful, and that's a lesson too. So don't record just the negative ones. But when there is an emotional situation, make an entry in this mystery school section. And this section is the section where you use the nine-step process to help you understand what the lesson was. What was the teacher trying to tell you? Very often this nine-step process will reveal what the communication was from your inner teacher. Now, one thing that you can use with the nine-step process is a section just before that called the Dear Master Letter. We'll be talking more about the Dear Master Letter uh, in the section on prayer, which I think is coming up tomorrow night, um, because that's essentially what that section of the journal is. But you first go through the nine-step process and try to get the answer. You can also write a letter to your teacher and ask for the answer, and you're going to ask in meditation to understand that better. The nine-step process is always used with meditation. You can meditate before or after you've gone through the process. The process itself is a rational, logical process. Now you want to try to get a deeper understanding of it through the intuitive process. So once you've gone through these nine steps logically, then go into your meditation for a confirmation of the new response that you want to have and for the understanding of the whole process. Now is all of that completely clear? Yeah. Can you repeat the, the ninth step? Okay, the ninth step is called new response. And what it is, is, uh, you know, in step eight, you were asking for uh, whether or not that emotion actually got your carrot or whether it would. The cause-effect relationship between the emotion and what it is that you wanted. And if you find out in number eight that the, uh, that the emotion didn't get your carrot or wouldn't get your carrot, then step nine is what would. What could I do that is more desirable on my part that will work better and will get the results that I want to get? That's step number nine, choosing a new response. And going into meditation to confirm it, yes. Once you, 
decided on a new response, if you can, or if you can't get a new response, then get that in meditation. Decide on it first, if you can, and then take it into meditation for confirmation. So, ninth step could, could be said that the ninth step is ask for guidance. Okay? You'll have more questions once you've attempted the process. So, by all means, try this process with someone tonight or tomorrow before you come back to class. So you will have, you will have had the experience of attempting to make it work, of going through it. And, uh, and then you'll have your questions and you'll be ready to, uh, to work with it and begin to make it work for you. Now, any more questions? Your beliefs on which it's all based. Is, is, are most of them, can, can they be boiled down to something really simple? Um, does that exist? Do you have that? It's not really that difficult if you understand that the belief is always how you feel about the catalyst. So all you have to do is say, how do I feel about the catalyst? And I know what my belief is. I believe that means that I'm less, or it means that they don't respect me, or it means that I am uh, clumsy. Uh, one of the interesting ones for me is when someone is using a vending machine and they get angry and begin to pound on it. What is their belief? I think usually the belief is, I have been insulted by a machine. <laughs> and boy, is that the ultimate insult. Even this machine doesn't respect me. Okay, there's always a belief about the catalyst. It, the, uh, in fact, this anger with a vending machine often comes out. People say things like, those things are designed not to work right. You know, that's a belief, and that's the source of my emotion. But also, it's not just a belief those things are designed to jib me, but I also have a belief that my anger somehow takes care of the situation, and that's the really erroneous belief that being angry about it makes it better. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the interesting beliefs that I find that most of us live with, even on a national level, when something has gone wrong, what is it that we try to do? What does Congress try to do? What does Parliament try to do? What does the Prime Minister try to do? They try to find someone to blame. And once we've found who's to blame, we printed in all the papers, now we've found who's to blame, that makes everything all right, right? Doesn't it? Huh? Well, of course not. It has nothing to do with making things all right. And it's so stupid. It is so stupid that a whole nation will get into thinking that way, and the government knows if we can find somebody to blame for it, it makes it all right. People will forget about it now that we've found the culprit who did it. Never mind correcting the situation, we just found who's to blame. You know? And we do that. I mean, we want somebody to admit that they did wrong. Now you admit that you did wrong, you know that you did wrong, now you admit it. Well, what for? Does that correct the situation? No, but it makes me feel better. <laughs> what do you say to yeah. the person who insulted your mother? What would I say to the person who insulted? You can't analyze your feelings to this person. Oh, I have had fun with situations like that. Oh, you can do more than that. You could say to the person, listen, I know that you really want my love and respect, and I freely give it to you, and you don't have to use these kind of techniques to get it. I love you. It doesn't make them feel wonderful, but it does point out what they did, and makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah, we do all sorts of things that are rather irrational in trying to cr to correct situations that we don't like. Now, placing blame is is one of the most popular.